That was yesterday. The IMF at Davos, Switzerland said the world economy is going to hit the biggest financial headwind since World War II. What does that mean? That's what we want to talk about. But more importantly, what can you do? Yeah. And we talked about it is, you know, when you think about what are your assets today, if you're hanging out with idiots, you're probably an idiot. <laughs> See, this is very important because the game these financial planners play is they only show you charts going back to 1981. And this is when Paul Volcker raised rates. So since then, we've been in a down cycle in interest rates. And sure, you can say the stock market always goes up right if interest rates are always going down. But what happens when interest rates start going back up? And usually the cycle is about 30, 40 years. So if you look at charts of the stock market going back to 1927, 1980 or 81 adjusted for inflation, it was pretty much flat. But see, they don't tell you that. Right. They just cherry pick the data of course. they want to give to you in order for them to collect their fees. But something even worse happening is the last crash was, let's say, 2008 when the repo market reversed and all this stuff. And most of these financial planners and real estate brokers, all they know is a rising market. Yeah, that's right. You know, since 2008, we've been nothing and happy days are here again because they kept dropping interest rates. Real estate went up, stock market went up, bond markets went up. Yeah. The problem with that is that the bull goes up the stairs. Yeah. The bear comes out the window. Here. When it comes, it's four months. That's how fast this bear is going to go out the window. So, no, it'll never go down. And going, when, the moment I hear that, I know it's going down. <laughs> yeah. And there's always, you know, Jim Rogers, I think, articulated it beautifully. You've just got to buy panic and sell hysteria. And sometimes, <laughs> you know, you can tell when there's hysteria. The problem with bull markets is it makes stupid people look smart. <laughs> yeah. And the saying is, the bull goes up the stairs, bear goes out the window. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down, it comes down fast. My question is, though, I don't know people are committing suicide. Mm -hmm. This is deja vu all over again, because in 1929, the saying was, watch out for falling bankers. Because mm -hmm. they were yeah. coming out of the window, killing people in the street below. Yeah. But at the end of the day, who do you blame? The Fed. It's the Fed. Because this is all just pushing Stupidity. people out the risk curve. So the whole thing here is, you know, get smarter. That's what we're talking about. Or at least hang around smart people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh my God, you know, it's going to be the, we're going to make so much money because we have carbon credits oh. and we have biotech coming online and all that. There's more opportunity today, yeah. but not if you hang out with idiots. I do think there's incredible opportunities, but I think it would come in pretty much the opposite arena. And that's just old school commodities. I think we're oh, going absolutely. to a long-term super cycle. Absolutely. I think you're going to see prices of things like coal, uranium. And I think the overarching theme in pretty much everything that you've said for the last 30 or 40 years is if you're going into an investment and everyone else is doing it and that's what they're teaching you in school, you're probably not going to make money. You're probably going to lose money. But if you're going into an investment and every single person is telling you, Robert, you're crazy. What are you right. talking about? You're don't, absolutely out of your don't mind. Do it. Don't do that. Those are the investments where you've made the most money. And it's been the exact same thing. You know, like we have no stocks, bonds, and mutual funds, because my rich dad taught me differently. So today, you know, like I was saying, and I said this all the time, we own oil wells. We don't oil oil companies. We don't own yeah. stocks. So again, when Biden cut the XL pipeline off, oil went from 30 to 130. Holy mackerel, we're making so much money today. The dangerous thing is people are being wiped out. In yeah. Inflation's killing them, yeah. food That's right. and fuel. That's right. That's what scares me. Yeah, but any intervention they have in a free market economy, it's always going to make things worse for yeah. the poor and middle class, oh, yeah. whether it's through the insidious, you know, invisible tax of inflation or whether it's just propping up uh, assets that are creating, you know, these bubbles where people get completely wiped out and misallocation of resources and malinvestment. I mean, th we've got to understand that central planning or Marxism, as you always say, this is a very, very slippery slope. This oh, is God. the road to ruin. Or as Jim Rogers says, you know, this is the quick path to the poorhouse. We need to understand that free market capitalism is not perfect but it's the best system we have to raise the standard of living for the poor and middle class. And we're going so Marxist, that's why I'm, so many kids, oh, if I go to college, I'll be fine. That's what you got taught Marxism. 
you know, they talk about, you know, tax the rich and all these other things they teach, but they think that's frightening today is what Klaus Schwab is saying. Someday you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Right. That's the abolition of private property, which yeah. is Marx. Yeah. And that's what they're teaching. The kids. Absolutely. And the crazy thing is they're trying to use inflation as a reason to tax the rich. And it's just completely perverse because the way you solve consumer price inflation Produce more. is by, like we were saying, by producing more stuff. And you know, if you're taxing all the people that are producing, are we going to have less stuff in the future? We're we going to have more stuff. No, as you said, the money just moves. Yeah. Right. We move to where we're treated the best. Yeah. And inflation is the worst tax of all. And it just causes more people as we're going to shift to UBI, Universal Basic Income, totally. and totally MMT, agree. which is Marxism. Someday you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. The yeah. government will give you your money. I really want to beat this dead horse because I think it's important. Good. We are experiencing global consumer price inflation right, right. now. Not just in the, this is a huge, huge problem. Global crisis since World War II. Yeah, absolutely. And their solution is to do what? UBI. Let's give people more money. And let's restrict the supply of goods and services even further by making it harder for the producers to actually produce. So what they're doing, they're trying to sell this to the general public. The way we solve consumer price inflation is by creating more money and producing less stuff. It's the complete opposite. opposite. Yeah, we need less money and we need more stuff. When you give people money, does it increase the debt? It depends on how that money is generated. But I understand, but somebody's got to pay the piper in there. Yeah, usually it's going to be produced through the issuance of new debt. So if it's the government issuing new debt for that deficit spending, or if it's a bank issuing new consumer debt, then you've got a loan to match up with that new money that was created. Yeah. So is there any money in a credit card? It's debt. And that's how money is created. Yeah. It's, you have to borrow it into existence. Yeah, that's right. That was 71. You have to borrow the money and money is created. That was a yeah. fraction reserve system. Fraction reserve system says you put your savings in a bank, let's say a hundred dollars, the bank can lend out thousand, ten to one leverage in there. And now they don't even need that. No. They can just create money out of nowhere. And that goes back to the central bank digital currency and them trying to ban cash. And I think that's why so many young people are in crypto. They know something's wrong. They just don't have the big macro picture of it. Mm -hmm. And they get caught up in all these swings. So you were talking about CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. What does that mean to you, George? Well, a Central Bank Digital Currency simply means that all the average Joes and Janes in society, including the businesses and corporations, now have an account with the Central Bank. In our case, it would be the Federal Reserve. But well, isn't that Marxism, central banking? It's absolutely 100% central planning. Because what happens now is the banking system is in charge of creating most of the new money. Now, it's a little bit different with these deficits and quantitative right. easing and whatnot. But usually it's the banking system. So if they keep that loan on their bound, if the bank continues to own the loan, they want to lend to someone who's going to pay them back. Right. Really? So hopefully they're going to lend it for productive purposes, meaning the majority of money that's being created is going to create more goods and services. Right. And that's why you don't have the inflation, even though the money supply right. increases. And that's why the free market works. Right. By the way, why the free market creates deflation, not inflation, exactly. prices going down. Capitalism actually brings prices down. Yeah. Because you can't compete otherwise. Yeah, which brings the standard of living for the poor and middle class up. up. Yes, but they're teaching Marxism in school. Yeah. That whole thing is so backwards run by school teachers. Oh yeah. my God. So if we move into the system with a central bank digital currency, then all the bank accounts go to the Fed. And then the Fed determines who gets the loan and why. And the big key there is the Fed doesn't have a profit and loss. They can lose money. So where a bank has to lend productively, the Fed can lend in a way that isn't productive. They can lend to whomever they want. They don't have to worry about being paid back. So that's centrally controlled money supply, debt creation. And that, to your point, is Marxism. But it's also a massive control. It's Orwell. Big Brother is watching. Yeah. They can tell exactly where you're spending your money, what are you spending on, and where is it. They can track you. And the reason I like this stuff here, it's real gold. This has been here since the Earth was formed. This is silver, been here the earth is formed. I can run with this and spend it anywhere in the world. They can't track me. Yeah. And so when Bitcoin came out, remember that they were saying, oh, 
they're going to use it for the drug trade and all that. Well, you think dollars aren't? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, <right? laughs> yeah. I mean, how yeah. can people be that stupid and drink the Kool-Aid from the Fed? That's what Rich Dad Poor Dad is. My poor dad, brilliant, brilliant academic, but flat broke. You know, but he thought all he needed was his PhD and, uh, and Stanford and Northwestern University of Chicago. And he just thrived on that. And my rich dad who never went to school goes, Is it, your father's an idiot. But they think they're superior. Yeah, that's right. They think they're above the law, some of them. The other thing, too, the thing about, you know, like reason we're like macro is history does repeat. Mm. You know, as Jim Rogers says, one thing history teaches you that people don't learn from history. <laughs> you look at books like 1984 and Atlas Shrugged, and you see, my gosh, how on earth could they have seen this coming? These were supposed to be fictional books, but they predicted the future and what we're living through now. I think it's just because, to your earlier point, history repeats. Or if it doesn't repeat exactly, it rhymes. <laughs> I mean, I was doing a lot of research just over the last couple of days on World War One and how World War One started. And it is eerily similar the to what Weimar we're seeing. Republic. That was World War Two, and as far as okay. the hyperinflation. But oh, World no, no, War no, One no. was really the... World War One that set up... I mean, that's what the... It was a chain reaction. Keep going, yeah, but me. the Duke gets shot. Right wherever he was in Slovenia or something like that. Uh, basically, then you have the two groups, you know, Austria and then the yeah, Austrian Hungary and then the other group. You have all of these larger countries that back one of the smaller countries that hate each other. And, you know, then the world gets kind of separated into two groups and then they go to war. And you see the same thing happening today with Russia. You've got larger countries that are siding with them. And then you've got other countries that are siding with the West. So you have two economies, especially Ukraine, that are relatively small. Now, they're wildly important because they provide a lot of the food and energy for the cool. world. Now, that's for sure. I'm not saying they're not important. U Ukraine is the breadbasket to so many countries throughout the world. Yeah, right. You got natural gas, you got potash, you got fertilizer, you've got lumber, Lithium. you've got a lot of stuff there Lithium for in, batteries. in Russia and yeah. Ukraine. But my point is you've got, from a standpoint of GDP, you've got two countries that are relatively small compared to the Japans and the Chinas and the United States. But yet they're in this conflict, you know, everyone, all these huge countries that do have, you know, a lot of economic power and huge militaries are picking sides and you can see it escalate and it just feels the same. Obviously, I hope it's not. And uh, there are no certainties. There are only probabilities. But uh, the point there is if you look at history like World War One, World War Two, you know, all of these wars, they usually start the same way. Right. I think you've got to look at the economy and you've got to look at censorship you've got through to that lens. Mac you've got to go macro. Yeah, but you've got to look at it through yeah. that lens of understanding that we're going through weeks where decades are going to happen. But, but this has happened before. Mm -hmm. That's the worst thing. And as, as like Roger says, history proves people don't learn from history. You know, I'm going, holy macro. And then what I found overall, because, you know, my whole fascination is why are some people rich and why are some people poor? But in 2022, the gap between rich and poor is now accelerating. It's getting wider than the Grand Canyon. But a lot of the times, the people that are getting poor is simply because they had poor teachers. Their parents are poor or they come from a poor background or like in my case, they're all school teachers who think even a PhD, that's all you need. The first goal that I had when I retired is just to look at my monthly expenses and say, how can I get my money to cover those expenses? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You see? And so how can I get my cash flow to right. cover these things? So then I know that I'm never drawing my savings down. Right. And I think it sounds easy and it sounds commonsensical, but very few people just kind of connect those dots and realize that if they can create enough cash flow with their portfolio to cover their monthly expenses, that is when you're financially free. Yeah, that's a cash flow game. Out of the rat race, all this stuff, you know, you got 10,000 a month coming in, you got 7,000 expenses, 3,000 net, you're free. Yeah. And there's tax breaks for it. Mm -hmm. The Be real estate area too, the same thing happened. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it'll be similar in the sense that, uh, you know, back in the late 90s, everything was dot .com and they were getting these billion dollar valuations. The internet was, the, yeah. It is true that the internet was the future, but not 
all those companies, you know, 99% of them go bust. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll most likely be the same with crypto. There will come, you know, maybe Bitcoin, Ethereum will come out winners in the long run and will be here. I don't know what purpose they'll serve. You know, I don't know if they'll be transactional in the case of Bitcoin or be more of a digital reserve asset store value. I'm not quite sure, you Mm -hmm. know, what place it'll play, but I think it'll most likely play out the same way the dot-com bubble burst in the 1990s. But I didn't know this, they're committing suicide? I was talking to them offline about cryptocurrency, and they said that their friends, you know, in this 20-year-old age group, are so into crypto that that's all they have, to the point where a lot of times the fresh and fit guys will have to lend them money for lunch. Not because they don't have money, but all their money is in crypto, 100% of it. They're and crypto not to billionaires, but no cash. Yeah, or millionaires or thousandaires, maybe in this case. But you know, it's not in Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's in all these Alt lesser coins. known altcoins that they think are going to or have the potential to go up a thousand X. Mm-hmm. And they're trying to be the next uh, you know, superstar on Instagram, billionaire, whatever that gets rich in crypto. And then they just get completely wiped out. And it gives them that very, very difficult lesson that uh, you know young investors have had to learn throughout the ages that... Uh, it's not different this time when Bitcoin was at 65,000. And I'm long term bullish on Bitcoin. Me too. But you got to pick and choose when you buy based on that panic and hysteria. And there was just, I was seeing it on Twitter nonstop. I was seeing it in social media. I was seeing it in all these like chat rooms like Clubhouse where the hysteria was just mind boggling. And uh, that's something that I think people can sense, but they need to make sure they're not getting caught up in that emotional frenzy. They're going to make bad decisions.